The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious God, thank you for this time in Romans. Thank you for the joy of being uh, one in Christ and for this incredible epistle that has so shaped the church and us. And so be with us in this last session. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um... So, um, we're not going to do the review at the beginning, we'll do that at the very end, just to kind of finish things. So, we're going to launch right into um, our session for today. This is where we've been. Uh, we're here, welcome like Christ and more than greetings. So, we're going to look at a couple things. And actually, this session this week, when we look at what it means to welcome someone, it really dovetails very well and what we talked a little bit about with the bishop last week, um, as he was talking, if some people brought the question of gay and lesbian um, welcome and where the church is at on that, many different views and opinions and viewpoints on that. But but that comes up when we think about how do we welcome people today into our congregation, not just on that issue, but a whole whole variety of ones. So Paul's going to talk about welcoming today and so how are we doing with hospitality and welcome when it comes to our congregation in this now what's called the nun zone where most people affiliate with none um, that when they said what is your affiliation religiously most of them check none in this county and in this area the Northwest. So, so how are we doing with that welcome? How do, how do we come at that? I think the issue of the Lord's Supper has been one that we've been wrestling with as a church. Um, you know, just the fact that we invite baptized Christians only to receive the Lord's Supper. Uh, some Luther congregations say not just baptized Christians, but ones that hold the exact same confession about the Lord's Supper that we do. Missouri Synod would be like this. The Catholic Church would be like this. Um, I'm pretty sure the Eastern Orthodox and Russian Orthodox churches would be um, like like that. And there's there's probably others that say, you know, certainly Wisconsin Synod Lutheran are going to say, no, only not only baptized, but we got to make sure you're a member or that you believe the right stuff about communion. That's an issue of hot. Some people say that's an issue of hospitality. Um, and so that, we might have a conversation about that today as well. So really, we're looking at what are the barriers that keep people away? Um, and, and, and how do we come at that? So, so let's start by reading the text itself. Oops. And um, we're going to actually start and go up to verse 1. I'm going to read through the whole thing, come back, do a little bit of teaching, and then we're going to get you busy right away here with uh, this issue of welcome. So this is chapter 15. We who are strong, remember last couple weeks ago we talked about Paul saying the strong versus the weak, and the strong versus the weak back then was the, the people who knew that they could eat meat, you know, that maybe wasn't kosher or that was sacrificed to idols in the marketplace. They, you know, because it wasn't a burden on their conscience, they are free to do so, but don't do it if it's going to cause the weak, someone else who thinks that is an important issue, to stumble. So that's what strong and weak was back a few a chapter ago, but I, I think it almost takes a different meaning here. We who are strong ought to put up with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us must please our neighbor for the good purpose of building up the neighbor. Please ourselves, please the neighbor, build up the neighbor. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. That's from a psalm. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have what? Hope. Hope. May the God of steadfastness... Um, uh, and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is kind of the beginning. Paul's going to take up the same theme again here shortly. Um, 
But he wants us to be one. He wants us to um, live in harmony with one another. I think Paul, right from the beginning, saw tons of division and saw how destructive that was. And so, in as much as there's a call, be in harmony. Now, this, let's, I didn't look up this word. Now I'm talking about it, but let's, let's see if we can look up this word here. Um, right here. Because uh, harmony in English, does he say be in unison? He doesn't say unison. He says harmony. Some of you music people. Does that mean we're all singing the same exact note? So harmony, you're singing a third, a fifth, maybe throwing a seventh, or I don't know. It means you're blending. It means you're blending. And somebody, okay, good. Unison so, boring. What's that? Unison can be very boring. Unison can be boring. Nice. Um, one's mind on Interesting. That is very interesting. So, so harmony is a minor... Um, Kind of the way you think, uh, it's, it's usually not translated as harmony, which is interesting. I bet you this is maybe the one, one place that it is. Yeah. So, in accordance, may the God's encourage grant you to live in harmony. It's almost like to be of one mind is the literal, um, the literal way you think about that. Um, I like this English word. Um, I'm going to trust the translators here. Um, because I think Paul doesn't envision that we're all the same, but that we're all working together. I think that's what makes us beautiful as the body of Christ, and the different perspectives, different gifts. But that those gifts are, are working together is the key. So this is the vision that Paul holds up, and I think the basis of it is that we don't please ourselves, but we please our neighbor. Um, is that kind of countercultural today? Maybe it's always been. I think so. Please ourselves versus pleasing our neighbor. It's Mother's Day. Thank you, moms, for pleasing others and <laughs> all the ways you've done that. Um, it's interesting that Paul sees this as a way that builds up. For the if you do that, you're going to build up the neighbor. I think we have to take care of ourselves, but if our number one goal in life is to please ourselves, that's when things get ugly. That's when factions start, you know. Um, are you looking to for what's going to build up the community is a good question. So then we get to our big, our main text for today. So on top of all that, Paul says, welcome one another, therefore, just as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. Um, so, what is this welcome? What is this? First, let's do a little work of pleasing that, that concept, and then we'll get to the welcome. What does Paul mean by pleasing? If you go back to chapter 14, you find that um, if you please yourself, you're despising others, you're setting a stumbling block before them. Uh, that if you injure the brother, um, causes ruin of the one who for Christ died. So, so when you please yourself, this is often what happens. Um, that if you let good be spoken of as evil, these are all things that Paul kind of lumps in to what it looks like to please yourself. And when you do that, it destroys the work of God and colors, causes others to fall and causes someone else to stumble. What we talked about a few weeks ago was no stumbling blocks. If eating meat, someone thinks is a horrible sin, well, don't eat meat in front of them, because, or a certain kind of meat, because it's going to hurt them. So don't do it. Even though you're freeing Christ to do it, don't do it. Don't cause, think about what it might be to not cause someone to stumble. Um, that's hard. <laughs> and no matter what you do, sometimes you're going to cause someone to stumble. That's been my experience as a pastor and as a person in community. Sometimes, oh, I step on somebody's toe and I didn't have, I did not mean to. So that's when confession and forgiveness comes in. And by the way, 
That's also where Jesus is commanded, if someone sins against you, you're supposed to go and reconcile to them. Because guess what? A lot of times when people sin against you or hurt you, they don't know they did it. I know it might seem crazy to you. I can't believe it. But maybe they were immersed in all kinds of stuff going on and they, you know, and they just didn't see it from your perspective and point of view. So that's why it's important for you to go. And then there, there can be confession and forgiveness. But when it comes to how we live, think about, oh, is that going to come? That's, that might be a real stumbling block for that person. I better go work, do some work there. Or, you know. So again, it, it's hard, but this is kind of what we're called, called to do. So then, after saying, don't think about yourself, think about others, we could spend a lot of time with that. Um, Paul says, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. So I, that's a text that we can just work on, just those words. For Paul, the big issue here is Jew and Gentile. And he's going to go on after the, the verse that we're, we just read in verse 7 to quote Old Testament texts about Gentile and Jewish relations. And they're really about Gentiles rejoicing that God is taking care of God's chosen people. But I, I think it wouldn't be too far to push it to say that Paul is envisioning a congregation with Jew and Gentile both there. And so how do we welcome one another? I think he definitely has a passion for how do we welcome the Gentile, the non-Jewish believer who maybe isn't circumcised, who, who doesn't have all of our regulations and doesn't have the covenant and doesn't have the heritage, how do we welcome that person? I think that's big in Paul's mind. I think also with all of his conversation and talk about strong versus weak, I think he's clearly thinking about, um, you know, maybe those who are more solid versus more vulnerable, um, people maybe newer to the faith. Um, but even here, the strong are the Gentiles, and the weak might be the Jews, who think they still have to keep all the food laws, you know. So it isn't just Gentile, Gentile weak, Jewish strong. Um, but, but he does bring this concept up of strong and weak. I'm not sure exactly what that would mean, but maybe the people who are more set and on a, on a foundation versus the newer, the more vulnerable. Um, you know, I think about that with leadership in the church. You know, sometimes people come in and they're new to the congregation and I want to say, Oh man, you'd be perfect here, and I gotta go. Whoa! Are you sure? You maybe you better give them some years of experience before you put them. You know, you're right in the thick of things. So, so, so maybe that's a little bit of what Paul's talking about. But I want us to get. I want us to now translate to today. If that's what it was for Paul in Paul's day, what is it for us? Um, what are those barriers? Um, what are the uh, um, the uh, divisions that are applicable today when it comes to our welcome that might be trouble, difficult for us to welcome people um, in. There's all the classic stories, you know, the homeless man who comes in. In fact, I heard a, a I think it was one of those email, you know, forwards that somebody gave me and, a, and the new pastor to the church uh, it took a new call and the, the Sunday before um, he came all disguised as a homeless person and walked in and uh, then you know and got all kinds of you know grief and struggle and then he introduced himself on well, your new pastor and the church oh, you know. so th there's all of those those are issues maybe that's we can talk some about that but I want I'm going to have you I'm going to go through the text a little bit and do a couple word studies and then I'm going to have you talk about well how do we welcome others today, um, what uh, what does this welcome look like, what does it mean, what does it not mean, is, is what we're going to talk about here for the next 25 minutes, and then we'll finish up with some of the uh, conclusions. So let me go back to the text, oops, um, and do a little bit of word study here with you. So I want to go up here, um, let's see, well, let's start with welcome word. So this welcome word is kind of interesting in, in Greek. Um, it, it literally means, lumbano means to take. 
That's just the basic word for take. But you put the you put the beginning here, pros lombo. Pros is a is a is a prefix here that means um, with or um, well, let's see. Maybe I've even got it here. Um, yeah. So it's um, to to take take alongside to take to receive, to with. In the Gospel of John, um, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, cross God. It, it was with God. So, so it means to take with you, literally. So, this, so it's sometimes good just to break the Greek word down. To take with, you know, to take with, okay? <laughs> take with you. And that gets translated into English in this con in this situation as um, welcome. So welcome is good, but take alongside might even be better. Um, by the way, I, this is one I definitely wanted to come back to. Put up with the failings of the weak. I don't like that English translation. <laughs> Sorry. Um, let's. When you look at it, like in the, uh, when you look at it in the NIV, bear with, much better. I usually like the New Revised Standard because when I put up with somebody, um, okay, yeah, go keep talking. <laughs> I mean, to put up with, yes, please. I, I happen to be in the NIV as well. I'm just starting at uh, verse 5, I just wanted to say that yeah. I'm not sure that the, the translations are so different right here, but what it says in verse 5 is, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement be the spirit of unity. In some ways, I think that the endurance part is the harder part. It's yes. the fact that, Okay, you've got to endure to be unified. Yes. First of all. Yes. And it's then, not easy. No, and then in, in verse 7 it says, instead of welcome, it says accept one another. Yeah. So there's a different way to, what does it mean to take with? To take one and be with. Uh, can we go back here? Did I put another? I can talk loud. Yeah. No, I know, but Anne's right there. She's right there. Yep. Uh, I think it might have something to do with being willing to listen to each other okay. rather than talk. Uh -huh. When we talk, you know, we know we're right. Yes. Got, I've got the right answer. Would you just listen to me? I've got the right answer. I never do that. <laughs> Especially if my spouse. But if I'm, no. willing, if I'm willing to listen to you, yes. my brother or sister. Yep. Um, the patience to listen. The patience to listen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Excellent. Um, I wonder if when we think about taking with this concept of welcome, um, my campus pastor, one of the things I learned from Jerry Swanson was the ability to make space for people. And when he talked and did training kind of for campus, we, we did a Stephen ministry program at, and, you know, where he got trained up on how to care and listen. And I remember when he was giving instruction, you know, it's one of those things that it's like amazing, it sticks in your brain. But he talked about making space for people. And you know, he, and if you knew Jerry Swanson, you'd be like, oh man, yeah. You, you, just, you just want to sit there with them. You don't even have to say anything. But I think that's, I think that's this Greek word, um, uh, you know, to, to take with. So, and so Barb, your concept of listening, very, very important with that. Yeah, good. Do any, please, but right over here, yeah. The question I would have is, you know, I greet people as they walk in the front door. Right. And if I'm going to be just listening, most of them don't, aren't bold enough to come out and ask questions when I see them. So I have to initiate that conversation uh, to get nice. going. Nice, so. nice. So welcome is a very active engagement, you know, in some respects. Uh, you know, I let you talk about this at your tables too, but... Uh, from what I read from church consultants, people are not greeted on the way into church like overwhelmingly, no matter what happens in that church service, they usually say they did not have a good experience. 
if they leave and no one greets them, it totally, no matter what happens in that worship experience, this congregation does a beautiful job at that. We used to have a designated, beyond Usher Bob, we used to have, you know, Happy Scott and then Darlene Britt, who that was their thing, that was, and we don't have them now, so now we have greeters who we've, who have hospitality gifts, who we try and greet people out here, then there's more greeting going on. So, so that's about welcome, isn't it? You know, how do we, you know, do we welcome people the same? as they come in. I mean, these are all important questions for us. So, um, let's see. I wanted to bring bring that up. Welcome one another for the glory of God. I think, please, another. Yeah. I just want to say... Pass it over. I just want to say in this version, which I really like, yeah. Wherefore, receive ye one another as Christ received us to the glory of God. Yes. So, so, so receiving. Receive, like, exactly. To, to take with, to receive. Embrace, nice. And now, how are we supposed to do it? And this is our key, and this is what I want to send you off in your little groups with. How did Christ receive us? How are we going to receive each other? Can we, Jim, is that one for the big, or you want to do the small? Yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, yeah. I just thought came to my mind. Yeah. When we talk about welcome, it could be there are different levels of welcome. Yes. We're, we're going to have a functionary greeting. Yes. Hello, how are you? Yeah. Whatever. And that the act, the welcome is self an action. Yeah. So there's the action of welcome in terms of how can I help you find this? How right. How can I right. do it to be right. any service? We have yep. that. And there's yep. that, whatever that right. goes beyond just saying hello. Yeah. Yes. Good. Okay, Kevin. One of the key things to welcoming is how do you transmit the rules of the house? Mm -hmm. Be the basics course here, or if somebody comes in and I say I've got Baker's Mark, and they say I want Happy Van Winkle, am I going to run out and get it, or just yeah. say this is what I got? Right. How? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Yep. Uh, I liked what you said about your your class or training that you were in and the pastor that was doing it said that you allow the people space, space to be different. Right. Uh, and we all have our personal space, yes. and we have layers of space beyond us. Like yep. we have acquaintances, we yep. have people that we greet all the time, and we have intimates. Yep. Well, that doesn't mean that you have to let one of those acquaintances that you enjoy being with into your really sure. close, intimate, personal right. space. Right. And so I think when we come to people that we know or like, or maybe we don't love them, but we like them and there's a difference, we're working toward love, maybe we're not there yet. Yeah. I don't think we have to let anybody into our very close personal space if they're not... They're appropriate. Exactly. Levels. And so I think that we can give people their space, but I think people need to allow each one of us our space. Well said. Very good. One more, and then this is the conversation I want you to have in your groups. Yeah. So Kim, and then we'll we'll break up for five five minutes or so. Well, yeah. you asked a question. Oh, it's okay. You're, you're okay. Yeah. If I go this way, it's okay. That's good. If um, you asked the question, how did Jesus greet people? And I thought that well, Jesus touched the leper, you know. Yes. And touched. You know, unclean, did unclean things, basically. Yep. And right. um, I was thinking when Ruthie was small in our prior congregation, she was eight, an infant, and there was a woman there that came that was in a wheelchair, and she was old and filthy and had sores on her hands, and she wanted to hold Ruthie. Wow. And I thought, what do I do, you know? And so I let her hold Ruthie. Yeah. And then I went home and scrubbed her. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, right. What do you do? Right. You know? Oh, wow. That is a perfect example um, or, or the, of the struggle. Um, your turn. Um, and if you're in a round table, circle up and talk about this question. Um, what are the challenge? What are the what are the applicable divisions or barriers? Um, that you know, how, what does welcome mean? Someone mean today for us as a congregation? What does it mean? What doesn't it mean? Do you think? 
And so talk, but let the conversation go wherever it goes. And we'll do five or a little bit more minutes. We'll see how it goes. And then we're going to come back to the large group. Okay? So let's... Uh, What I want to do now is kind of try and capture from the large group some of what you talked about in the small group. Obviously, that's impossible. But if there were some neat kind of ahas or kind of or just if somebody from your small group feels comfortable saying, "Well, this is what we focused on. It's such a big topic. All of them could be different." So, um, looks like we'll start right here. Yeah. So a welcome, to really welcome, to move to the next, is to make space for them by getting them connected in some way. Small group, community group, choir, you know, quilters, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, excellent. Some, some way of serving. Bible study, I don't know. Yeah, excellent. Excellent comment. That's really important. Yes. Um, one of ours is the embarrassment factor. We have to get over ourselves, but yeah. uh, we always feel like we don't know... We, we were afraid to, in, to attach, attach to somebody because we don't know if they've been here a long time. Or right. We don't want to embarrass ourselves if we go to 11 o'clock and they go to 8. Yes. And I think some of that has to do with the smaller groups getting engaged with people so that you know more of a core group yeah. of people, but also being well, willing to yeah. stick yourself out. I think the name badge is helpful a lot. Yeah. Be willing to say, you know, and, and yeah. Yeah. Good. reach out a little Good. bit. Yeah. Wear your name badge. badge. No, it's not for you. It's for others. Okay? Don't please yourself. Please others. Okay? Yeah. Well, we, have, we kind of talked about our experiences, each of us, how we felt more welcome, you know. Good. And what experiences we had. Uh, like I brought up the fact that the now with the, the beacon or the bulletin, it's all there. You don't have to be fumbling back and forth. So... For somebody new coming to the church, they pick up the bulletin and they know exactly where they are in the service. It just goes from point A to point B. They're not fumbling back and forth. And I think that's a, that's a welcoming thing to okay. make the service easier. Excellent. Just in the way we spread up our worship stuff. Um, by the way, that is a selling point for having some projections. Because that even takes that welcome a little bit further. Talk to Ben Borson. Just came back from Arizona. His congregation projects there, projects everything. They do the liturgy just like we do. But um, he said how welcoming, how easy it is to follow. And so that but it's in the same vein. So pluses and minuses to everything. But thank you. That's a welcome. How we print up the whole service. Please. Unfortunately, when you project it, you don't see the music. And That's like, correct. like one of the hymns today is just the words in it. It's very, it's very difficult hard. to yeah. sing that song. Yes. Yeah, you have to, there's ways around that. But yes, no, that's a downside to doing that. That's right. Um, please, other other things that when it comes to welcoming that you talked about. Yeah. Well, I don't know if we talked about it, but when he mentioned that it's, it's sometimes embarrassing to say, you know, yes. you don't know him. Well, I am new, and so I'm comfortable just saying, I'm new, I don't know your name, you know, or can you tell me what your name is? Or, yeah. Something like that. Or you can just say, I know I should know you, but I don't remember. I don't remember your name. Yes, good. Um, does anybody else know the perfect question that I'm always telling you? Anybody yes. remember it? Doug mentioned it. What is it, Doug? Yeah. Yeah. How many years have you been Or, or how, how long have you? Yeah. Yeah. How long have you worshipped here? If you're early and late service, and you know, don't say, are you a visitor here? Because then they'll say, I've been here 50 years, how dare you? Don't you know I'm such and such? I found this church or something. No, no, you, no. you say, how long have you worshipped here? And then they say, 50 years. And you go, oh, that's so cool. Tell me about the history. What did you do? And then, then if they say, this is my first Sunday, you go, oh, my goodness, oh, well, you cannot lose with that. So, so I expect a lot of people here to be talking about that. Okay, other things. So thank you, Gloria. That's, that's very helpful. Um, 
I see Barb here, and then we'll come over to Jim. Yep. We talked about welcoming children or or others who might not be totally appropriate in the service. Right. And how much oh. that, that makes us all feel welcome. And there were some stories in our group about, you know, when our kids were little and people welcomed us anyway. Yeah, okay, so that is an often tension and challenge. You know, can you make space for families with little ones who maybe are going to be a little noisy, a little restless, and parents have to make good calls as to, okay, and this is going too far, we need to get out. Um, but also... You know, if they make a little, they drop something and everybody goes, you know. Or if a little baby is crying and at the first hint of a cry, everybody around them goes, you know, that is not welcoming. I've had people tell me they no longer come to church here because there's too much noise of kids. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not really sorry you're not coming, but I'm not changing the culture. Because this is one of the few churches around, period, that has cross-generational people in work. I mean, you can find churches that have 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds. You can find churches that have, you know, 50 and 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds. But all together, you don't see it as much. That's a part of being welcoming. Yes, there are limits. You know, <laughs> there are times as a parent, you take your kid out. You know, I mean, okay. But then there's also times where they're learning, they're adjusting, and so you kind of have to make space for them. One idea, by the way, on that that's come from some of the parents with younger kids is to have a transition area. Like, for instance, in our, it just kind of naturally works that over here <laughs> is kind of a more of a family area where a lot of families with kids gather so that you know if you sit over there, you've got to be comfortable with more restlessness versus maybe somewhere else. It's a cool idea. Um, we, it kind of happens in four months. Dave, uh, oh, sorry, that Jim, and then then over to Dave. Yep. Uh, there are a couple of those, several different, a couple of major things that happened for us being attracted in years. We, we saw this thing about the hometown band. Yeah. And we came here, we found there was someone else in there that we knew from another venue. Mm -hmm. So we had an acquaintance, if you will. Yeah. And we were looking for a church at that time, so we saw there was an annual statement. Uh, in the narthex, right? So we were able to go through it. Okay. And then uh, uh, somewhere, somewhere down the line, we shortly after we went to the youth auction. Yeah. And that was something we were looking for was a very strong youth program. We saw what happened when they, they, what they wanted in order to send those kids to New Orleans. Right. And that, that told us to you know, take a chance here. Yeah. It's something that we mentioned earlier that there wasn't too long before somebody called me and said there should be a service in such an area. Yeah. So, so there I, you go. I can't imagine why. But that's it. Thing. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yes. We also talked about uh, the differences in people and, and physically welcoming someone. Uh, you know, some people are handshakers, some people are huggers, some people don't want yeah. the actual physical contact. Right. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you're being welcomed any more or any less. And yes. It's important to recognize. It's good to have some sensitivity that, around that. Yes. The, just because they're keeping some distance doesn't mean they may not be welcoming you. Right. Uh, they just may have a different comfort zone. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, and it's important on both sides to recognize that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Very well said. Other things that came up in your conversations. What does it mean to welcome people? You know, how do you make space for them? Put them at ease. Okay, Clara. Good. Good. Okay. Accept them as they are. Okay. Make them feel included. Mark, yep. We didn't talk about this, but yeah, I right. think about Kathy Ford always refers to the little sign that used to hang in the office that said, you know, church is, is not a spa for the saints. It's a hospital for sinners. Yeah. So when we welcome people, we welcome them as a fellow patient. Yes. You know, Excellent. welcome to the hospital. Yeah, I'm here because I'm sick. Yes, yes, good. Excellent. Yeah, okay. Joyce? I just want to say, I'm reminded of... Joe Mentor. Joe Mentor, okay. 
Many when he here. came to yep. church, he was always late. Yes. <laughs> However, he would come in and sit on the left-hand side, usually toward the front. He would grab the coloring books and the crayons, and he would, when the kid got unruly or whatever, because lots of families sat on that side, he'd just reach over and hand me the crayons yep. and the paper. It was perfect. Yeah. And that's, you and know, as a, yeah, as a whole, as we do that as a congregation, that's what makes a culture of welcome. So, and I think that's really important. Um, so I'm, I'm going to say a few things here and challenge you, and then I want to I want to move us, unfortunately. I know we always do this, but if you want to talk more in depth about some of these subjects, we got an open forum two weeks from this summer, from today. So... It's one thing to talk about a welcome, but then once people are here, then we have to talk about, okay, what do you make room and space? How do you do that? And that's where some real difficult ethical issues come up, okay? So, Bishop, um, Jake, last Sunday, if you weren't here, you know, talked about the issue of gay and les with gay and lesbian peoples and how does a church make space for people and who have that self-understanding. How do we do that? Um, you know, some congregations believe that the way to do it's not like, well, you're, because we, we, I think we all agree that to say that, you know, we're all sinners. This is a place, hospital for sinners. We're all, none of us come in because we've done it all right. So whether you're, whether it has to do with human sexuality issues or whether you like to eat too much or you this or that, we all have sin and we all are brought in the same way. So we can make space for gay and lesbian people. That way, and that's I think the way the church has traditionally done that. But then gay and lesbian people say, "Okay, yeah, that's great. I'm here, but now what do you say about me? Can I have an expression of what I understand my sexuality to be, um, and what would that be?" It, it, or the church historically has said celibacy. So when you understand yourself, you can't express that. And and um, you know, Bishop Jake was saying. No, I clearly believe that homosexuality expressed in a kind of marriage-like relationship is not sin. So, but that's certainly, as he acknowledged, not something that we have agreement on. Here in this congregation or in the wider church, all of the wider church has basically said congregations that want to move in that direction are totally welcome to do so. Um, to the point today that we have, um, you know, gay marriages being performed in our synod and, and many congregations. So... That's just one example. Other people would say to Bishop Jake, okay, but do we say that about, and it's not necessarily an apples for apples comparison, but I just have to raise the issue. Well, some of the maybe steals or whatever, do we, they're welcome, but do we say, okay, that's no longer sin? You can, in order to be here, of course, other people would say that's not a correct comparison, and I, I understand that. So, but that's where it gets difficult. The thing I appreciated about what Bishop Jake said was, um, you know, we kind of have to decide, is it or isn't it sin? <laughs> um, or we have to just agree that we're not sure. Or some people say it is, some people say it isn't. Um, and this congregation has said that there's too much difficulty biblically and, and also for the unity of the church for us to just shoot out in a path that is not sin and, and we're going to do marriages and whatnot. But regardless, hopefully... Under the banner of the gospel, we can make space for people, and, and gay and lesbian people in particular. We have youth who are struggling with their sexuality and wondering about it, and we have pastoral conversations, and we, I think, do a very good job with that. But of course, the challenge is, is okay, what are the limits? What does welcome mean? What doesn't it mean? And that's... That's where we find ourselves, I think, in this in some difficult ethical situations. But we could go way beyond that and talk about what Martin Luther King Jr. said. He said, Sunday is the most segregated hour, Sunday morning, in our country. And it's still true. You know, um, socioeconomic, <laughs> birds of a feather kind of flock together. Maybe that's okay. <laughs> Maybe that's okay, um, but but also I think maybe that also is a critique of how welcoming we are. Do we welcome a person of color? Is my, I, I think 
think we do, but I don't know. Do we welcome somebody that's clearly in a different socioeconomic background than somebody else? Is our programming focused on upper middle class or middle class people? Everything costs money. <laughs> Movie with your pastor, a good example, I think. Man, that's such a great program. And, and truthfully, most of us love to go to the movie theater and then go out to the restaurant. That's been the most successful menu. But, let's face it, that's like 45 bucks per person. By the time you're done paying, well, it's not maybe that much, but, but it's up there. So, not a great, so when we think about our programming of a congregation, how accessible is that? When I think about, I also think about issues of, of people who are differently able. The doors, you know? How easy is it to get into the church? Is there places for people to sit? Are there restrooms? You know, all of these things come into play. We have to, it's, it's, so we're, the Holy Spirit, I think, is constantly helping us think, how welcoming are we? I think, uh, going back to your, what do you, after the initial welcome, and most of the people that say, they track how people get involved in a church community. By the way, it's like 80 to 90 percent come in because they have a significant relationship to someone. Um, if you just decided to show up one day and come to church, and there are a few, I mean, that's courageous. Most people don't do that. Most people come because they know somebody, just so you know. Um, because they putting that toe in the water. So they'll put the toe in the water. If that goes well, then there's the next step. And you guys talked about it. Well, did I meet anybody? Have I made any connections? And that's where when I think about our congregation's welcome and how, how we might grow beyond our incredible place that we're in now is do we have more entrance points, more community groups, more places where people can, you know, more Bible studies at the YMCA, more, you know, in-home Bible studies, more places, the choir is an entry point. There's all kinds of entry points, but we need more so that someone can, you know, make that scary next step. Um, I, love, I love, the quilters are a great example. I mean, they, they're, they're like sometimes 30 gals in here. Well, they, why? well, you know what, they're us. I watch what happens. They invite people, and when they're there, I, at least I think, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I mean, people seem to be really celebrated when they come to join them in their mission. So, so we are doing beautifully on that, but I also think there's that constant place of how do we grow, how do we, um, how do we work on that. So, okay, so that's my summary of your great conversation. Um, I, we've got like just a few minutes, so I want to move back and um, finish this great class in the next five minutes. I know choir members may have to have to scoot out if you haven't already. So um, I want to go now to chapter 16. Uh, again, we have to skip some stuff and good stuff. But at the end of Romans, and as I bring this class to a close, um, I want to just say a few words about these greetings that we see in chapter 16. First, they're a, kind of a, a question. Because if you remember, Paul hasn't been to Rome. And the thought that he knows all these people, that they've gone to Rome or he knows them, has been a question for scholars. Um, it seems like these people are intimately known and... And so there are all kinds of theories about what's happened here. Some people say that this, these greetings were part of a different letter that in the tradition then got tagged on because the other part of the letter got lost. And, and so, so it got inserted early on in the tradition. All of our earliest manuscripts of Romans has chapter 16 um, and has the format. No one questions whether they're authentically Paul, but there is some... Logical stuff. It almost seems like there's three benedictions at the end of the, the letter of Romans. So a lot of people say, well, we may have some things, you know, but, but that's kind of just fun scholarly stuff to think about. The fascinating thing is looking what we see behind the curtain, so to speak, in these greetings. So let me just make a few comments. So I commend to you our sister Phoebe, that's a woman, a deacon. Now, some of your translations will say deaconess, but it does not deaconess in the Greek, it's deacon. Okay? So it's um, of the church in Sencre, that's near Ephesus, so that you may welcome her in the Lord as is fitting for the saints, and help her in whatever she may require from you, 
for she has been a benefactor of many and of myself as well. So um, Phoebe has really helped Paul, has helped a lot of people, and when she shows up, I want you to do whatever for her that she requires of you. Now, the church for many years, um, with this word for deacon, it can be minister. Um, if you remember in Acts, there was a controversy about, you know, the apostles were preaching, but they were also being deacons and waiting on tables. And so they created a special group of people to do that service, that kind of ministry, and those were called deacons. But as the church moves on, we see this word deacon to be kind of leadership term. So a lot of scholars, because Paul says in some places women can't ever have authority over men, or at least that's what it says in Timothy, um, they say, well, wait, he couldn't really be calling a woman a deacon because that's a position of authority. So it must have been that a deacon was a deaconess. It doesn't say deaconess. So, so Paul, so, so again, it's like, how can this be? If we just translate the way it is, I think clearly underneath this greeting is a place where a woman was in a position of authority and leadership. I don't know, I know you can dance around it somehow, but I don't see any other way around it. But, but people have those way around it. So that's kind of exciting to me because I think Paul in these greetings, in fact he'll call other women um, fellow laborers. So, this, which is Paul's favorite word for ministry, uh, you do with that what you will, but then we get down here, Greek Priscilla, uh, Prisca and Aquila, who work with me in Christ Jesus, and who risk their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Greet also the church in their house. So, so again, we see a little bit underneath this, that churches in the beginning were house churches. It's especially the way it is now in China, by the way. Greet my beloved um, Epinetus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked. There's that labor, who has labored very hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Wania. Uh, um, this is a fascinating word when we look at what's underneath these greetings. Wania is... I might well be finished. Um, were presently, they are prominent among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Let me finish that. I know we're close to being done. Don't worry, I'll close it up. Close it up. Um, they were in Christ before me. So, um, sometimes this is translated, instead of relatives, it's translated as compatriots or kinsmen. Um, and usually... In the later interpretation, the last thousand years or so, these were always translated as two men. And these two men are called superlative or of note among who? The apostles. Now, yes, in some place in the New Testament, Apollo, apostle is just simply a, somebody that's a messenger. But, but at this time, this is late. Romans is one of Paul's last letters. Apostles were apostles. These were the main dudes. Main, sorry, that's a male term. These were the main folks. So here, someone named Juania, that's the way I say it in English, but is named as superlative among the apostles. Now here's the deal about this name. It's like Chris in English. Is Chris a male or a female? Who knows? Yes. The answer is yes. Now, if it's Christine, it's a woman. If it's Christopher, it's a man. So you know by the ending, but we shorten it and we say Chris. Now, here's the deal, though, in Greek. Nowhere do we find this word as a man. Even though it doesn't have the ending, we don't find any of this. This is the only man named Juania in the history of the Greek culture as far as all of the extra-biblical literature we can find. So, either it was the only guy that's ever been, like that song that, where his dad named him Sue or something, you know, either, either it was one of those... And the early, when we go back to the early church tradition, they understood this, this person as a woman. A woman is called by Paul underneath these greetings as superlative among the apostles. 
So when people say to me, there's no biblical support for the leadership of women, I just say Romans 16 and I'll say, thank you very much. There's obviously something going on here in the New Testament. All right. So i got to finish this off. This has been a great study. I want to leave you with Paul's, one of Paul's parting words about his ministry. This letter has been the letter in the history of Christianity. I think it's probably, if I had to say, what's the most important book in the Bible? That's, it would be this one. That's what I would say. Um, it's an impossible thing to say, but that's what I would say. So let me close with Paul's words. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to win obedience from the Gentiles by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem as far around as I... Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the good news of Christ. That's who Paul understands himself to be as a proclaimer of the good news. I hope you will too, that this good news is um, that Christ has given us his righteousness and made us his children by grace that we receive in faith. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thank you.